Revelation 8, after which Alistair will come and speak to us from the Word. The seventh seal and the golden censer. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel, who had a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer, with the prayers of all God's people, on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it onto the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down onto the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass were burned up. The second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel sounded his trumpet, and a great star, blazing like a torch, fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. The fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark. A third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in mid-air call out in a loud voice, Woe, woe! Woe to the inhabitants of the earth! because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. There we go. Evening everybody. Before we go any further, let's pray. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb praise and glory, wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Father God, we praise you for your word, praise you for your love for us and your grace that we can know you personally through Jesus Christ, and that's only possible through his death and resurrection on our behalf. We well, thank you that you are the one who is seated on the throne you look after us. Because of you, one day we know that we will never hunger, we will never thirst. The sun will not beat upon us, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be our shepherd. He will lead us to springs of living water. And you, O oh God, will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Lord, we long for that day, in the new heavens and the new earth, when Jesus Christ comes again to judge the living and the dead. But until then, Lord, help us to have a, a real understanding of what it means to serve you here on earth as our God and as our King. And through this passage, through these two chapters, which are quite terrifying in some sense, Lord, but in other ways quite comforting and very encouraging to us, we thank you that you, in a world that is turned upside down because of our own sin and rebellion against you, you are in control of all things. You are immovable, unshakable, and your great plans and purposes will never be thwarted, will never be... Uh, put aside and will never be changed because you are the one true God who is in control of all things and we praise you for that Lord. Open our eyes that we may see your word and what it means to us. Open our ears that we will listen not selectively and not defensively but that we would listen wholeheartedly as we take in this wonderful passage tonight. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. When I was younger I used to smoke. I know Confession time. But I did. When I was younger, I used to smoke cigarettes. Uh, do you know why I quit smoking cigarettes? 
It wasn't because just because uh, the girlfriend at the time, named Jenny, uh, didn't want to kiss me anymore, didn't want to hang around me too much because I stank uh, or smoked all the time. It wasn't even that reason, although that was a factor. It wasn't even because it was costing me all my pocket money and all my hard-earned cash was going to buying cigarettes. No, that wasn't the main reason why I stopped smoking. The main reason why I stopped and why I quit smoking was because I was actually very, very scared of the consequences that it would have on my health. I really was. I was scared of the consequences that it would have. Because, I mean, I started reading, my brother's a doctor, and he handed me all these doctor's journals and things like that. And after reading some of these doctor's journals with these seriously gruesome pictures of what my lungs and my mouth and my throat would end up looking like, or could end up looking like, and after also being exposed to a couple of those very graphic anti-smoking commercials on TV, I thought, no way, <laughs> it's not worth it, this isn't for me, I quit. Now, look, I'm not here to bash anyone who smokes, if you smoke cigarettes, that's fine, uh, Claudia, don't get stressed out, sorry, <laughs> just kidding, it's, uh, that's not what I'm hopping on about tonight, I know, I know that it's not that easy for some people, but what I'm saying is, I just found it very hard to ignore the warning labels on every pack of the cigarettes that I bought. I mean, it's right there. It's staring you in the face. It's in your opposite. This is going to kill you. Warning. Uh, I mean, it's not very attractive, isn't it? It kind of made me just want to put it away and just not do it. But I mean, these days, it's even worse. Have you seen the warning labels that you get on cigarette boxes these days? Okay, all of those who said, yes, I know you smoke. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> some, actually, some actually have pictures of damaged organs on them and what, you know, what you're going to look like on the box of cigarettes. As you open it up, there's damaged liver or damaged organ. It's pretty, it's pretty gross. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's meant to be a deterrent, I understand. But some boxes of cigarettes are a little bit more subtle, like this one from Marlboro. I mean, that's subtle, isn't it? <laughs> On a big carton like that, smoking can cause a slow and painful death. Well, it's obviously not the cigarette companies who came up with the idea of warning people of the dangers of smoking. I'm told uh, by Madeleine, who's actually uh, studying to be a doctor, she's not here tonight, but it's the FDA, the Food and Drug Association, and I think also the World Health Organization uh, who are responsible. But a lot of people don't like it. They don't like seeing that kind of thing. They don't like seeing those warnings on boxes of cigarettes. But I think as much as people want to complain and moan about, moan about it, I think it's actually a really good thing. I think they really are good warnings to put on these boxes because if you know that what someone is doing is going to cause them a lot of harm and that they're exposing themselves to grave danger, I mean, isn't the best thing that you could ever do for them to, to warn them about it? To warn them about what they're potentially exposing themselves to. And I mean, forget about smoking. It's not just the same with smoking. I mean, think about anything. I mean, that's why we've got warning signs all over the place in our world today. I mean, we've got electric fences with signs that say, Danger, high voltage, stay away. And they're like, you're going to get fried. I mean, these construction sites have huge warnings around them as well. Don't come near this area, especially without a hard hat, because if a brick falls in your head, it's not going to go well. That's why we've got uh, danger signs and warning signs when there's ha hazardous chemicals being uh, taken somewhere. Or, you know, when you go to the beach and there's shark-infested waters or there's a dangerous rip current, that's why we've got signs that say danger, swimming prohibited. Warning signs are given to tell people that they're exposing themselves to danger. And if they persist in what they're doing, they're going to face severe consequences. And that, brothers and sisters, is exactly the issue here in Revelation chapter 8 and 9. In fact, it's a theme that runs throughout all the way through to chapter 19 of Revelation. John's vision now takes the form of a series of warning signs, all with the same intention. They're given to tell people that they are exposing themselves to grave danger and if they persist in what they're doing, they're going to face severe consequences. Well, just to give you an idea, a recap of where we are, we're still in the throne room of heaven in this, uh, in this vision of John the Apostle, the disciple of Jesus Christ. Jesus has been given a very large scroll with seven seals in it. This, we saw a few weeks ago that the scroll is a heavenly book containing God's script or God's entire plan and purposes for the world. And Jesus is the only one who is found worthy to open the seven seals on this scroll. And as, they start, uh, as he starts peeling them off, as they are peeled off one by one, the first of the four seals we saw that we had, we got four different colored horsemen. Do you remember that? The four horsemen of the apocalypse. <laughs> and they are bringing death and destruction. We get the idea basically of trouble and hardship coming on the world. When the fifth seal is opened, we see the Christians who have been slain because of the word of God and the testimony that they maintained. Uh, they, they want to know how long it's going to be before the suffering of God's people comes to an end. 
And then the sixth seal is opened and we're given a very, very sobering picture of God's judgment which, which is going to be handed out once and for all on the human race. These are just from the previous chapters we've been looking at. Uh, Dr. Newby took us for a bit of an interlude where there was a break between the first six and the seventh seal. Last week he took us through Revelation chapter 7. Now, now it's time. Now it's time for the seventh seal to be opened. And when Jesus opens it, there are seven angels who are given seven trumpets. I've called them seven trumpets of terror because, I mean, if you have a look at the passage, that's exactly what they are. As these angels sound them, they're announcing a whole series of, of what we call calamities or what's also referred to as woes. Calamities or woes that are warning signs of God's great judgment that's going to come one day to everyone who rebels against Him and who stands opposed to Him. Now, I just want to say that I don't think we're meant to see these trumpets or these warning signs as representing single and particular or, 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 or actual events. You know, in particular, you know, like, oh, well, that's, you know, try and work it out like a Bible code kind of thing. No. What they're actually referring to are patterns of events that are going to happen many times and in various ways throughout the age of the church until Jesus Christ comes again. What we're being told here is that God is going to cause terrible things to happen to wicked people, first of all, in order to punish them for their opposition to the cause of Christ and because they're persecuting His people. But also we're told that even through these, these warning signs, these judgments, God is always calling on sinful people to turn away from their sin, to repent, and to turn to Him instead. See, these calamities, these woes, they're not God's final judgment on the ungodly. They're actually kind of like His initial judgment and are meant to be giant warning signs, huge warning commercials up in the sky, uh, or actually down here on earth. They're meant to be giant warning signs telling people to stop. Stop what you're doing. Turn around. Because if you don't listen to these warning signs of His initial judgments, well, then there's no way that they're ever going to escape their final doom. So with that in mind, let's jump in. And we're going to have a look at chapter 8 and 9, some very key passages in both of them. Let's start with 8 verse 1. Hope you've got your Bibles open. We'll follow from chapter 8 verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. When I read that, I actually... Although that's, that's, that's weird. It is a bit weird, isn't it? I mean, with all the action and the suspense that's been leading up to this point, I mean, you'd expect something a little bit more dramatic, something way more climactic than that. I mean, you know, like fireworks or, or angels bah, bursting forth in song or something. But as the seventh seal is opened, there's not a sound to be heard in the whole of heaven. It's just silence. Why is that? Well, I think it's probably because the hosts of heaven stand in dread and awe. They are dumbstruck with what is about to happen with the opening of the scroll. All the inhabitants of heaven, the angels, the elders, the four living creatures, they stand spellbound, lost for a long time, for half an hour, in breathless, silent wonder and amazement. As the scroll is opened, seven angels are given seven trumpets. And we're going to have a look at them tonight. Or at least we're going to have a look at six of them tonight. We'll take it from next week with the rest. Have a look with me from verse 7. The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down on the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. So angel number one blows his trumpet, and there's a storm, a storm of hail and fire mixed with blood. Obviously, whatever's happening, it's meant to bring destruction upon earth. Can anyone tell me, here's a, we did a little bit of quiz this morning, I'm not going to do anything like that, but just a little bit. Who wants to, uh, just to get your attention? Does this remind you of anything from the Old Testament? Yeah, that's it, that's exactly it. It's kind of like the ten plagues in Egypt, isn't it? I mean, a couple of these references here are very reminiscent of Moses and the Exodus and the, and the ten plagues in Egypt. It's just like the ten plagues in Egypt here, except, well, it's different. Yeah, there's yeah, fire and, and a hell mix of blood. But the, the point is the same thing. The, and the intention is the same because these judgments, what they are doing is that they're coming from God and they're being directed towards evildoers or people who rebel against Him, people who are opposed to Him. And that's just what He did to Pharaoh in Egypt. If Pharaoh was directly opposed to Him, He wouldn't let His people go. He was 
you know, repelling against the God of the universe. And God did exactly the same thing. He poured judgment against evildoers there. And the interesting thing as well, uh, we're going to talk about that in a little while, but unlike the disasters that we saw with the four horsemen a couple of weeks ago, those affected the human world, these ones, these disasters have a devastating effect on the natural world. And we're being shown that in a world that's governed by God, you know what? There's actually no such thing as natural disasters. In a sense, they are sent by God to warn people that He is alive. He is on His throne. And He is calling people to repent. I mean, these disasters, it says that they were hurled down on the earth. Where were they hurled from? They were thrown down from heaven itself. God made these things happen. And God initiated these disasters. Let's carry on reading. We'll see for ourselves. Verse 8. The second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Again, very similar language to the plagues in Egypt. Hey, remember the river Nile? Blood, gross, ugly, same thing here. What John sees next is something that looks like a, a mountain on fire being thrown into the sea. You know, not only does God use disasters on land like we've just seen as an instrument to punish and to warn the wicked, He also uses the sea itself as a tool, as an agent against these people. But this judgment is a lot more severe than the first. A third of the sea becomes blood. A third of all the live creatures of the sea die. And a third of the ships are destroyed. And that means all, you know, all the passengers and crew members too. I mean, if, if you think of all the loss of lives and all the loss of property in, in the sea disasters throughout history, this vision doesn't seem that crazy after all, does it? I mean, the floods that have occurred, the tsunamis, the shipwrecks, they don't happen all by themselves. God is warning people that He is in supreme control of all things and they need to bow their knee to Him in response. Let's carry on reading. Verse 10. The third angel sounded his trumpet and a great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and uh, on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. You know what God's message to his people? To his people, his beloved Christian family, those who are following the Lord Jesus Christ, this is God's message. My dearly loved but persecuted children, remember that your Savior sees your tears and is mindful of your afflictions. Don't think that these evil persecutors of the church will ever find real rest or lasting enjoyment. Not only will the land and the sea be a source of judgment and disaster to them, even the fountains and the rivers throughout this entire age will be turned against them, says the Lord, in a way. Let's carry on reading from verse 12. The fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark, a third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. I mean, okay, stop that. This, this is getting serious, right? This is getting pretty serious. I mean, even the sun and the moon and the stars are against these people. Very interesting a lot of human beings have actually worshipped these things as their gods. Or they've looked to the stars, you know, for guidance and for inner peace and tranquility. But God says, you have no idea how wrong you are. The very things that you worship and that you look to for spiritual enlightenment and fulfillment, I'm going to use them against you as warnings of my judgment. And that's why every time we see the sun turning dark in the Bible, what's it a sign of? God's judgment. It happened in the Old Testament. It happened in the New Testament. When Jesus hung on that cross and the sky turned black, the sun was darkened. Picture of God's judgment being initiated on sinful people. I mean, even the stars and their constellation and their courses somehow fight against the enemies of God's church. It's a startling picture that we get here. You know, there's a lot of stuff happening behind the scenes that we're actually not aware of. And I think the main picture, we, uh, we're going to go over this a couple of times tonight, because I know, I mean, this is hectic, this really is, this is, this is crazy stuff. But it's true, this is God's word, and this is His message to us. And I think the main message He wants us to say, see is that God takes sin very, very seriously. 
And he takes his church very, very seriously as well. We sometimes forget that God is actually way more involved in the universe he created than we actually realize. I mean, he uses all of his creation to accomplish his plans and his purposes for his church. This is mind-blowing. I mean, when I, when I was studying this, and I, believe me, I, I went over and over and I read and I studied, and, you know, this, my mind was blown. The entire universe, including even the sun, the moon, and the stars, is used by our Lord as a warning for those who don't serve Him and who are persecuting His children. So the first four trumpets all target the natural earth's affecting food and water supplies. This will cause the people on the earth to experience extreme hunger and, and thirst. Now I want to ask you, why would a merciful God put people through such torture? I mean, sure, yeah, they're, they're bad, they're wicked, they're rebelling against him, they're persecuting his church, but why would a God who's you know, merciful put people through that torture? You know, why not just kill them? Just get rid of them so they don't suffer? Well, I believe it's because he's still giving them a chance to hunger and thirst for him while they are still alive. I mean, that's exactly what God did to Pharaoh in Egypt. He kept increasing the judgments for the purpose of getting him to turn away from his arrogance and his pride and his stubbornness and hard-heartedness and instead to turn and believe in the true and living God. Did Pharaoh listen? Did he heed God's warnings? No, he did not. And in the end he paid dearly for it. And the big question is, will people who are opposed to God today or throughout the history of the church, who, whether they persecute the, not, per, persecute the church or not, whether they're just simply standing opposed to God, rebelling against God, will they listen to these warning signs from God? That's the big question. Well, let's carry on reading to find out. Now, we're going to jump over into New Territory, chapter 9. I want you to read it to me from verse 1. This is the fifth angel sounding his trumpet. Chapter 9, verse 1. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet. And I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. And out of the smoke, locusts came down on the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. <sighs> it's getting pretty weird. Well, let's carry on. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not allowed to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes. Anybody want to take a guess? At, uh, explaining this? No. The fifth trumpet blows. John sees a star that had fallen from the earth. Notice he didn't see a star that was falling. It wasn't like when he was wishing upon a star. You know, he wasn't seeing a shooting star or anything like that. He actually says the star had already fallen, which is a definite sign of something that we learn from the Bible, which is a picture of Satan, the devil. Luke, uh, in Luke's Gospel, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall from the sky like lightning. Uh, we told in the Old Testament, you know, there's pictures of the Old Testament as well that tell us that this is talking about Satan himself, who, we're told, was given the key to the bottomless pit, which Luke calls the dwelling place of demons, the abyss, in other words. Now, this isn't talking about the final hell or the, the, the lake of fire, you know, which we get later on in Revelation. But it's actually, you might consider it what we would think of as the underworld. The place where Satan and his demons currently dwell and operate from at this particular moment in time. It's not the final hell or the lake of fire or the bottomless pit that they'll be thrown into at the end. It's not there yet, but this is the underworld. Uh, and then we see this great swarm of very bizarre creatures emerge from this place, from the abyss, from the underworld. They're like a swarm of locusts, but they've got very strange characteristics. And they're given power, given all kinds of powers. And unlike real locusts, they're not here to eat the plants of the earth. They're not here to harm the earth. They're just here to torment people. Now, we, this is clearly some kind of army of demons that, we be, that we're dealing with here. And then we get a name uh, a bit further on called Apollyon or the destroyer, that's Satan. He's their king, and they obey their king completely. And that's the thing about Satan you need to know today. Satan, and all his demons who follow him, they hate us. Satan hates us, because he hates Jesus. 
and we belong to Jesus. He hates us. He wants to destroy us. And his demons here, depicted as locusts, they are the agents he uses to try and do this. The normal lifespan of a locust, I'm told, is about five months, and this is how long these demons are allowed to operate. Now, I don't even mean to read anything too hectic into that. I just think we're meant to understand that it's a definite and it's a limited period of time that they will be allowed and ordained by God himself to operate in the world like this. But I want you to know that as Christians, this isn't something that we need to be afraid of. We do not need to be afraid of this. God will always protect his children from Satan's attempts to attack us and to oppress us. And because of Jesus, Satan has no power. He's got no hold over us. We're told in 1 John that greater is he within you than he that is in the world. We don't have to fear Satan, but we must be mindful of him and be aware of his cunning, scheming acts to try and trip us up and to make us do things that displease God and try and get us down so that we don't serve God the way we should. But we are told you that God will use even the work of the devil as a punishment and a warning for people who rebel against him. Again, in order so that they'll turn around, so that they will repent. Well, I mean, surely that's something they'll listen to, isn't it? Weren't they listening to those warnings when, when they are confronted by evil and oppression from Satan himself? Will they not see that they need God and they need to turn to him? Well, we'll just hold that question for a little while and we'll get into that. But let's carry on looking and have a look at the sixth angel. Chapter 9, verse 13. The sixth angel sounded his trumpet, and I heard a voice coming from the four horns of the golden altar that is before God. It said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of the mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. The sixth trumpet is talking about times of war. It's describing warfare. And it's, it's amazing, isn't it, that even war is described as a way that God is warning people of his coming judgment. All the battles throughout history have been predetermined and preordained by God. I mean, the month, the day, and the hour have all been decreed by him. There's nothing that happens in human history that is outside of God's plan or outside of his will. Well, John sees this vast, huge armies, these armies on the field of battle, there are so many horsemen that he's unable to count them. I mean, he hears their number and it's, it's ridiculous. It's 200 million. I think that's right. My math is terrible, but if I understand it, it's 200 million. It's also a symbolic number. Just there's, really, there's a lot and there's a lot and there's a lot of them. And you know what I think we can take from this is that every aggressive military empire has, while worshipping power and being hungry for domination, they've eventually suffered catastrophic defeat and humiliation which is a foretaste of what is to come for the wicked I mean you think about it it happened to ancient Babylon it happened to Greece it happened to Rome even Hitler's third Reich and to the Soviet Union every power hungry nation every military empire that worships power and domination has and will be will suffer catastrophic defeat and humiliation is it by the other team's almighty power no 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 no. it's by God ordained by God, sent by God as warnings of his great judgment that is to come. And I mean, they, they're all warning signs that people should repent and turn to God. And how could you not listen after all of these warnings? I mean, how is it possible that people would carry on rebelling against God after he's given them all these danger signs? I mean, uh, natural disasters of, of, of the land, of the sea, of, of, of spiritual oppression... Of, of warfare, of all these kind of things. I mean, surely people would listen and see that oh, we are puny little human beings. We cannot depend on ourselves and our own power. We actually, these things have shown us that we need the, uh, an almighty creator God to come and rescue us. That's what they're meant to do. And surely that's enough to make them listen and believe. I mean, come on. What else is God supposed to do? Well, have a look at verse 20. The rest of mankind that were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshipping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone and wood. Idols that cannot see or hear or walk. 
nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their theft. No matter what the warning, they just keep on doing exactly as they were before. Keep on living just like they were before. Worshipping the stuff that they made, instead of worshipping the God who made them. Now, again, what are we supposed to do with all of this? What are we supposed to make? How do we apply this to ourselves exactly? I mean, is it saying that, like some people think, that the tornado that struck Oklahoma City recently was God's judgment upon that city? Or the flash floods that happened in Ireland a while ago? The hailstorm in India that killed nine people? Or the fire that swept through Kailicha a few months ago? Were they all a direct result of people's sin and rebellion against God? Was he pouring out his wrath and judgment on them and those things? I want to say no. That's not how we're meant to interpret these chapters in Revelation or the book of Revelation at all. You, you can't just look at every single bad thing that happens in the world to say and, and say that is a direct sign of God's punishment and his judgment on them specifically. I mean, we live in a broken and fallen world where just plain and simple things are out of balance. Things are out of whack with the Creator because of our own rebellion, because of our sin and because of us. There's always going to be earthquakes and famine and drought and floods and all other kinds of natural disasters because our natural world is messed up and there are all these things are going to happen all the time. Jesus said that himself. These things are going to come. They will happen. They might happen more and more intensely as before he comes because that's just the world is, the world is spinning out of in sync with its creator. The world is going to, it's groaning as Paul says in Romans 8. The world, because of our rebellion and sin, is not getting better, it's getting worse. And it'll only be better when Jesus comes and he fixes it all. And he makes it all right. And the new heavens and the new earth will be perfect. And the restored order will be brought back into place. And even war itself, you can't say, well, that's a direct judgment on people. But in a sense, what we are learning here is that the main point of all these visions is that throughout the time between Jesus' first and second coming, God will again and again punish people who are persecuting his church and rebelling against him by inflicting upon them some sort of disasters in every area of life, both the physical realm and in the spiritual realm. The blood of the martyrs is precious in the sight of the Lord. The prayers of all God's people are heard. God sees their tears and he knows their suffering. And he will avenge them. He is a God of justice. But... He's also a God of mercy. And He will use whatever means necessary to get people to wake up, to realize how puny and how futile man is and how awesome, powerful and sovereign God is. He might use an earthquake. He might use a tsunami. He may even use a flood. He might even use a meteor shower. I don't know. He may allow Satan to torment people or show them the horrors of war to get their attention, to shake them, to wake them up. And so when we hear about a bomb killing innocent people in Boston or a hurricane causing devastation in New Orleans, we should realize that that is a wake-up call for all of humanity to see how futile and puny and finite this world is and these our lives are and how awesome and powerful and sovereign God is. And we, when these things happen, we should, they are disasters and they cause extreme, terrible pain and suffering. And we should love and show compassion and get involved and help people and do whatever we can to, to get stuck in there and help the community who is suffering through these things. But we should also pray that people will get a huge wake-up call. Pray that people will be understanding through us who God is. And our job is to, to get out there and to faithfully witness to them praying that they would understand that God is on the throne that things are not alright with this world and they need to say sorry to God for thinking and living that way and humbly bow down before his throne you know the sad news is that in spite of all these warning signs mankind in general doesn't repent they will not humble themselves and admit that God is the king of the universe And we are not. Some have that. Some people have. And I've actually read many testimonies of people who become Christians after experiencing similar types of of disasters that we've just read about. Through the pain and the hardship they were going through, 
they, and through the faithful witnessing of God's people during that time, they came to the understanding that this life is not under our control. It's under God's. And they listened to God's warnings. He got their attention and they put their faith and trust in His Son, their Lord Jesus Christ. And they became part of His great following in His family of believers. As I close, let me read to you a quote from C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis said, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our consciences. But He shouts to us from our pains. I believe that to be true. And I want to ask you, has God got your attention? Perhaps you're someone who's still maybe on the run from God. You haven't fully connected with God. You haven't had your sins forgiven by Jesus and you haven't put your faith and trust in Him and serving Him faithfully as your Lord and Savior. I wonder what God needs to do to attract your attention. What does God need to do to get you to listen? If you are a Christian already, well, you're not exempt from disaster or calamity, but at least we know that it's not because of our sin. And we know that Jesus has taken care of our sin already. And we can look forward with confidence to a day when, although things are messed up in this world now, they're going to get a heck of a lot better. In fact, they're going to be perfect. We look forward with confidence to a day when our world is going to be put back to order and things are going to be right. Wrongs will be made right and tears are going to be wiped away. And we can know with full 100% confidence that every single thing that happens in this world is done according to His great plan and done for His glory, for our good, and for the sake of His kingdom that He is establishing. And we can take that to heart and keep on witnessing, keep on being faithful to Him, keep on paying attention to His Word and never drifting away so that we can be faithful followers who endure to the end. Let's pray. Father God, you whisper to us in our pleasures, speak to us in our consciences, but yet you shout to us from our pains. Father God, I, I know that there have been many people who have experienced pain and hardship lately. Lord, we know that a lot of it is just because this is a result of the world that we live in. It's a result of our original sin against you, Lord, that caused death and destruction and chaos to come into this world. But Lord, sometimes we, we're reminded tonight you actually speak to us and you call us through these events. You, you purposefully allow these things to happen so that we can hear you, so that we can know you, so that we can be part of a relationship with you and be encouraged in our faith in you. Well, thank you that you're not a God who just leaves us alone, but that you willingly pursue us to get our attention. And Lord, I thank you so much that you ultimately did that by sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins and your Holy Spirit after that to come and to open our hearts and our minds and to illuminate our minds to the Gospel and to the Word that is your Bible. Father, thank you that we can look forward to a day where, although things look pretty messed up in this world right now, we know that you sit on the throne and you have complete control and sovereignty over all things. And Lord, we are excited for that day where things are going to get better, where wrongs are going to be put right, our tears will be wiped away, there will be no more suffering, no more hardship, no more death, and that everything uh, will be put back to order. Lord, in your great kingdom that is coming, where Jesus Christ will be our God uh, and on the throne, and we will worship you in spirit and truth amongst thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people, Lord, all around your throne. For you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. 
Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually... You are our God. You are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually... You are our God. You are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually... You are our God. You are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually, you are our God, you are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. 
Folks, we actually... You are our God. You are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually... You are our God. You are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually... You are our God. You are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually... You are our God. You are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually... You are our God. You are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually... You are our God. You are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually... You are our God. You are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually... You are our God. You are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually... You are our God. You are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually... You are our God. You are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually... You are our God. You are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually... You are our God. You are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually... You are our God. You are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually... You are our God. You are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually... You are our God. You are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually... You are our God. You are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually... You are our God. You are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually... You are our God. You are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually... You are our God. You are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Folks, we actually... You are our God. You are our King. Help us to take these things to heart tonight. In your name I pray. 